and present with me today is uh, Senator Frank Uggen. And um, I'll maybe f for the record go ahead and uh, please uh, introduce yourself and who you're representing, and uh, we'll keep that for the record. Okay, so. My name is John Brown. Can you uh, take it closer, please, so that. Okay. Name is John Brown, General Counsel for Jones and Guerrero Company, Inc., but I'm here representing myself. All right. Hello, my name is uh, Sandra Cruz Miller. I'm from the Office of the Governor. Good afternoon, half a day, Senators. I'm Doris Floresbrook, Public Auditor. Anthony Camacho, uh, on behalf of the Office of Public Accountability. Carlos Baldon, Deputy Attorney General, Attorney General. Robert Kono, GSA. Uh, so just um, just to start things off, Bill 162 um, actually then is a combination of Articles 3 and 9 and 12. And uh, when we first started out, uh, Articles 9 and 12 was in a separate bill. Um, and it got passed by the legislature twice and got vetoed twice. And uh, I think we're getting close to where the, the goalpost is. Uh, so this time we decided we're going to go ahead and reintroduce uh, Bill, I mean, Articles 9 and 12, uh, but also um, uh, attached to that Article 3, uh, which is the source selection article. Uh, assuming that you know we've chewed up uh, articles 9 and 12 enough and but we still have we'll we'll take the time at the end to discuss uh, any loose ends remaining loose ends with articles 9 and 12 uh, so with with that we can go ahead and start um, you know I, we did. We, I did say that uh, in the notice that we sent out was that we were going to really kind of focus in our discussions today on, uh, I believe it was sections two through. I don't know that we're going to be able to get through uh, through uh, section from two to twelve. We will have a, a second round table hearing. Uh, that will be held on October 26th, so that's next week, and um, and we're going to be focusing on sections 13 through 25. So, um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, um, I'm going to start off with uh, John. If you have any comments on 162, or, or we can just go section by section, that may be best. Um, so if we go, if we start at section two, legislative, or section one is just the legislative findings and intent. Uh, so we can go right into section two. And if anybody has any comments that they would like to make um, on that particular section. Also present with us is from the um, from the port. Al, want to go ahead and introduce yourself for the record? Uh, good afternoon. Turn on your mic, please. I'm Alfred Duenas, uh, Port Authority of Guam. I'm the uh, Deputy General Manager for Admin and Finance. And with me is uh, Alma Javier, who's our uh, procurement person. Procurement person? Procurement manager. Okay. I, I just want to make sure. Okay, fine. Thank you. Um, maybe, John, you, maybe to kind of help the discussion along, maybe you can kind of give an overview of uh, the changes in Section 2 with respect to uh, definitions. Right. Uh, 
I don't think any of these are real earth-shattering uh, changes. The main point has been to try to distinguish um, uh, in the law the difference between what is a responsible bidder or offeror and what is a responsive bid because that continues to confound people. Uh, and uh, that that's the, the most e expansive changes that were made in, se in Section 2. Oh, um, also, the uh, request for proposals, uh, we've introduced a, a new provision uh, for uh, brought back the old competitive seal proposal uh, from originally adopted in, in 16 public law 16124. So we have two different methods of source selection, both uh, calling for requests for proposals. So we're calling the uh, request for proposal for professional services, an RFP, that's what we were accustomed to, and the new method of competitive proposals, calling that RFCP request for uh, competitive proposals. Uh, both of them are generically referred to as requests for proposals. Yes. Uh, thank you. I just realized I, I didn't see it before and I apologize, but in the definition of responsible bidder, and I think it's a, a case with you, John, responsible bidder is normally determined even after award. And I think that was a, a, a case involving you. And now you're changing the definition to be before award. There's been a number of cases where uh, responsibility, uh, uh, like getting licensure, uh, does not have to be, you know, if it's an off-island firm, they don't have to get the license until after award. They don't need to have a Guam license before. And I don't know the... Uh, the nuances, but is that going to change now because you're making responsibility before award? And I remember, John, in your early case with JNG, uh, uh, the case was on that issue of when is responsibility. So now making it before award when legal cases have made it after award might be in conflict. Go ahead. Yeah, the, the, uh, Definition of capability, which is one of the essential ingredients in determination of responsibility, is defined to say uh, before award. You have to be capable at the time of award. So, and this continues along with that, that concept. Uh, one of the principles, one of the standards uh, of uh, responsibility in uh, uh, the GAR section 3116 is the uh, availability or the ability to obtain the features that you need to become responsible. So the real question has typically been about whether you need a license at the time of opening of bids. Uh, that has been the distinction uh, that it has been expressed uh, and caused some confusion. The, the law is, is pretty clear that uh, what it has meant and what it has said is that uh, responsibility is determined at the time of award. So after award is not clear, but the, avail the ability to perform uh, in a lot of cases, in the federal cases in particular, we've seen a lot of this, is that it, uh, your performance is at the time of performance where your capability is determined, not necessarily at the time of the award, but that's not inconsistent with the definition of responsible, which says that you have the ability to, to have this at the time of the award. So if you appear to have the ability at the time of the award, you're a responsible bidder. But I, I think it seems that probably what may be causing some confusion is as determined at any time before, oh, at any time before award. Okay. Up until, up, up until, up to the point of award. My recollection is you can make the award subject to, and you give a 30 day notice saying you need to do all of these things. Uh, you know, so it's, it's, the award is made to, to complete the responsibility criteria. And the awardee has, let's say, up to 30 days, depending on the agency, to say, uh, you have submit your license, submit all these other things. So maybe it's semantics, I don't know. But we'll see when the first procurement appeal comes before me to, to decide this. Well, the, the real, you know, uh, 5211 in the IFB uh, says, uh, the law 52, section 5211 says that you can make an, you can only make an award to a responsible person. 
So they have to be respond determined to be responsible at the time of the award, not afterwards. But as I said before, the de in the standards for uh, responsibility in Section 3116, uh, the ability to perform, the ability to be capable, is one of the one of the factors. So if you can be determined to have the ability to have this uh, after award, that may suffice. Whether you have the ability to obtain a specialty license after award, I think, is problematic. And I think that the determination of that is also problematic uh, after award. So I don't think under Section 50 of the law, 5211, you can issue an award. It's distinguished between intent to award and award also. And it, at the time you give an intent to award, you don't necessarily have to be responsible. It's the time the actual award takes place that you have to have the, res the responsibility characteristics. Anthony, you... And then, and then to Jessica. Yes, uh, in, in essence, uh, if you were to keep this, this would actually have the effect of limiting competition. Uh, the people who would be prejudiced the most would be pretty much off-island entities. And keep in mind that as an island, uh, we have to get goods and services from a variety of off-island vendors. We're not all locally sourced. Uh, we talk about big entities such as DOE, such as GPA, such as GWA in particular. Uh, that's the, uh, the type of uh, uh, procurement that this would affect the most. And I, there's nothing wrong with the definition of responsibility. It's more or less just the timing. And right now the uh, procurement law does allow uh, a bidder who's not licensed, essentially, to submit a bid. And if they get awarded the bid, then they get a Guam license, so on and so forth. If they're not, but it, they're still allowed to participate in the bidding itself. Uh, this, uh, there's a procedure where any bidder, essentially, uh, before the award, uh, can claim that the other party or another offeror or bidder is not responsible, and that would obligate the agency to conduct an investigation determining responsibility. Uh, this could be used at that point, uh, or this language could be used to knock out, like I said, those other off-island bidders who aren't licensed. So that's the main effect. It would be a... Uh, violation essentially of the procurement policy uh, that encourages broad-based competition and, and I think because of the limiting factor uh, the, I don't agree with uh, the, the language either uh, it's a real simple fix just eliminate just delete it uh, at any time before award uh, just get rid of that and pretty much uh, the definition itself stands yeah. Jessica oh, I, I just had questions as to why or, or it <coughs> is this meant to limit responsibility determinations to only before award and what's the effect of that when so under this you would have to make a responsibility determination before the award so then the agency comes out with a determination that a certain bidder is responsible then awards the contract and now after the award of the contract something goes wrong and the agency now wants to be able to find that this bidder is not responsible and maybe go and cancel the procurement and go back to the drawing board. Are they prohibited from making it? I mean, now, now they've already made this responsibility determination prior to the award, but, but now it's been found that they aren't really responsible. Now, now are they prohibited from making a non-responsibility determination after the award? Can they now? Now they've got this thing on paper saying, "Yes, you are responsible." Whoops, you weren't really responsible. How can we take back the contract now? It seems like it adds another wrench into Could. being able to rescind the contract. Okay. Well, let me let me get some inputs from. Well, I was going to say that if you look at G and you take it, that seems to be where your issue is, because it, it there's many situations. In which you bitter or okay. and, and and so speak and so so we keep track on our record then it's Bob Pono <coughs> from legal counsel from GSA okay no no just so that <coughs> we keep track as we're going through the thank you okay I'm thinking G is where Ms. Top has her concern uh, because you uh, there are many situations in which a bidder or offer may be eligible at the time of the bidding or offer or the RFP, but for whatever reason, may no longer become uh, a proper responsive person. So for example, on an RFP, if you wanted to get engineering services, for example, 
an RFP goes out. The people you have listed as part of your team, you make a decision. But sometime after that, they have a disagreement and that team member leaves who may have that special skill that would have, that made them eligible. So you could still find them non-responsive after the fact because they are no longer eligible. I think that's where G would come in. But I agree with Mr. Camacho of OPA. You're OPA on this one, Tony? Yes. Yeah, okay, o OPA. Um, which he says, would you take out that language at bid opening? Okay. John? Well, once again, if you look at the law, it says that the award, the contract should be awarded uh, to the lowest responsible bidder. So you have to make a, a, a determination of responsibility at the time of the award. I don't think anybody wants to change that part of the law. Uh, it, that That is not in, in this bill that we're modifying that section G of 5211. You also look at the definition of capability, which is one of the factors for being a responsible person in the regs. And it says capability is determined at the time of the award. So. The time of award is important. If you don't have a determination of responsibility by the time of the award, you're not allowed to give them the award under the law. Now, if they are at the time of the award responsible and after they've got the award, they lose their um, uh, professional licensed person subcontractor because of a breakup, then they may not be able to perform. That's a, then a contract dispute, uh, not a, a, a protest dispute. So those are separate things. Let's keep them separate. Okay. Any final comments on this particular point? I had a question. Okay. Just um, I kind of maybe missed one. Okay, J just identify yourself quickly. Yes. Um, is, there, is there a reason that um, these definitions in are put in 5201? rather than in 5030? Because 5030 is the definitions section for the procurement title. So uh, I just wondered if if there's a reason it was put in 5201 instead of 5030. Uh, this is John talking again, John Brown. Um, the original law, public law 16124, created this structure of things, the definitions that are particularly pertinent to Article 3, they put them in 5201. Section 5030 applies to definitions of, uh, that you find throughout the, the whole code. Whatever the framers of the original model code, uh, ABA model code, they do the same, they have the same structure. We, we followed that structure. Uh, other than that, I can't say that there's any particular rationale for it. Okay. Would it be better to put these in 5030? Because then it makes clear that these definitions are applicable to the entire title, not just this article. I don't think that it would add anything or detract, detract from anything. I think that what it opens the door to is uh, making all the definitions that we find in the regulations and the law stuck into 5030, and that will make 5030 a rather cumbersome procedure. Uh, bill uh, section. Uh, the, the notices, uh, the de references to responsible and responsive bidder are only in articles in Article 3. Article 1 doesn't have any anything to do with responsive, responsible bidder. Article 2 doesn't. Article 4 doesn't. That's specifications. Article 5 and 6 have to do with contract provisions. Article 7 has to do with, I think it's a, a federal, w anyway, none of the rest of them have anything to do with that. So it, it doesn't make it more clear that it, res it applies to everything because they don't, those terms don't come up in the other sections. So it's not inappropriate. No, yeah, I just wondered. Okay, thank you. I also want to recognize the presence of uh, Senator Spaldon. Thank you for joining us, Senator. Okay, so we'll go ahead and um, is there any further discussion on Section 2? Okay, Section 3, Methods of Source Selection. 
Uh, John, can you go ahead and I, I'm I, if, if you're wondering, I'm referring to I'm asking for John to kind of give the the overview of the changes made uh, because he um, assisted me uh, considerably in putting this together. Thank you, Senator and uh, Roundtable members. Uh, article uh, Section Three again deals with the methods of source selection. Uh, 5210 is the omnibus section that has always said that these are the identified what the uh, methods are and and made the point that you had to use uh, competitive sealed bidding uh, uh, <coughs> this kind of backs off of that a little bit uh, it is uh, more or less on par with the rest of them although it is the default fallback if the others don't apply Def competitive sealed bidding is, has always been the only method without any conditions of use all the others have conditions for use of, for instance, RF, RFPs has to be for use of uh, acquiring professional services. And uh, that emergency service, emergent procurement obviously has an emergency condition. An RFP, uh, IFB can always and continues to be always usable uh, uh, for its uh, ease of use and objectivity. So that's... Uh, that's really the only change in, in uh, 5210 is cleaning that up a bit. Okay. Any discussion on that? None. We'll move on to Section 4. And here we get into the first uh, source selection method, the competitive sale bidding. Uh, John, can you go ahead and give a, an overview of the changes? Uh, it was thought appropriate and timely to finally bring back competitive sealed bidding um, to the Guam Procurement Code. It was originally adopted as part of the uh, uh, Guam Procurement Code in Public Law Section 16.124 and was soon that thereafter repealed in uh, uh, Public Law 18.44. No reasons why it was repealed have been ever uh, uh, clear to me, but uh, competitive sealed bidding uh, is also known as uh, the best value of uh, bidding method. Um, best value is not as objective as IFBs uh, and I think for th that reason it is difficult to monitor its objectivity, its validity, uh, and I believe that's probably why they took it out uh, so many years ago. But it's, it's, it's a, a necessary tool to a procurement regime that is responsible enough to deal with it and I think GovGuam is now had a lot of experience with this and can understand it uh, and uh, conform themselves. Competitive sealed bidding has got an, uh, because it does have some moral hazard, and by that I mean uh, it invites, um, be, because it, it does allow this, it kind of invites abuse of the uh, subjective decision making process. Uh, so there's some limits on the use of it, as there are with all other methods of source selection other than I, uh, the IFB, uh, which tend to try to limit it for everyday use. It's not meant for everyday use. It's meant for larger projects. And in fact, what really pushed to bringing this back is the uh, ABA model code amendments in the year 2000, which uh, beefed up the uh, competitive sealed bidding uh, method. Is, is, excuse uh, me, sure. but isn't isn't what you're discussing the section five, the competitive seal proposal? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, I am competitive so seal bidding. Is the basically the IFB that everybody? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's that's right. I'm sorry. Uh, so reserve that for the next section discussion. Um, there's been some comp problems with the competitive sealed bidding and this re recitation of a wage determination. Uh, it is not, there's no authority given to uh, the agencies or to the public auditor to enforce wage determination violations and it was felt it was in, we needed to water this down a bit. Yes, maybe some, some kind of notice that it is out there, but it's Department of Labor's responsibility to enforce it. So we took provisions or watered down provisions which that seem to make this a procurement issue out of it. Uh, and in the uh, public notice regime, uh, the uh, we took out the, the notion uh, that uh, it has to include a publication because the regulations never required a publication. 
uh, the regulation said that it had to be published only if the, the uh, amount of the contract was more than $25,000. The, the regulations say that you, you commence a uh, uh, competitive still building bidding process by actually distributing notices of the uh, solicitation to interested parties uh, sufficient to uh, foster competition. So we've tried to uh, make it a, a little bit more consistent with what was said in the regulations. Uh, and the rest of it, you know, was pretty uh, self-explanatory. But that was the, 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 the thinking behind the changes that were made. So, so if, if, this, if this goes through, mm -hmm. we won't see notices in the newspaper anymore of bids? Well, this doesn't change the regulation. This, this just took out some of the language that was perhaps inconsistent with the regulation. Uh, or, and uh, it, you know, we, we just go by the way the regulation said. The, the, there are, are new provisions in the law that just came about in the last year that require posting, for instance, on websites of, of solicitations. Uh, this was not the intent of this to minimize that part, but it, it recognizes that posting on a, on a website is really not actual notice to anybody, whereas publication would be. It, 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 so it still accepts the publication requirement that's in the regs, but the regs recognize if you're publishing every little solicitation under $25,000, that you're wasting a lot of money, provided that you go out and distribute these things to uh, uh, fairly and equitably to, to foster competition. Anybody have any comments? On I do have one. Uh, this is where in my uh, written testimony I, I stated that what we're really talking about when we talk about public notice and publication in newspapers is a baseline. What is the minimum required uh, for public notice? And for the longest time it's been uh, newspaper publication. In fact, our law is based around that because if you publish it in the newspaper, then even if you didn't read the newspaper that day, under long established court precedent, that's still constructive notice. Uh, that you had it. So that's why the newspaper is pretty much the safest uh, and it's been the longest method of, uh, um, of notice. Now, yes, uh, we are in the digital age now, and uh, as Mr. Uh, Brown correctly points out, that uh, you know we could publish them on websites. Uh, this is an opportunity to relook at what is the baseline in terms of notice. And uh, uh, however, uh, uh, the problem with putting it on the agency's website is simply there's no uh, there's no guarantee anybody would actually read it uh, or know about it. or know about it uh, you'd actually have to be monitoring uh, the agency's website to actually uh, uh, to do that we don't really uh, to my knowledge I don't even think uh, we're to the level uh, as a government where uh, we have all of our various uh, solicitations on one website for example uh, with you know some jurisdictions have that uh, but well, it's not one of them. We're, we're just, we haven't evolved to that level. Hence, uh, the need for uh, at least the baseline of uh, publication through a newspaper. I think it still has value. I think that uh, uh, in terms of uh, preserving transparency, I think it's necessary. Even if it does cost a little more, uh, even, even if it's for the uh, solicitations uh, under 25000 I, I think that uh, we owe it to the public to tell us or tell them, or notify them, uh, when we have a solicitation, period. And uh, uh, so far, uh, the newspaper still remains uh, uh, the only baseline guarantee of that that notice. However, if you want to relook and, and change that, this is the opportunity. Senator. I have a quick question. Uh, thank you very much, Attorney uh, Camacho. But, Mr. Brown, my impression about, or my understanding of your statements was that this is redundancy to some extent. There are requirements for publication in rules and regs, and there are laws that also require publication. So by virtue of deleting this particular requirement in this provision, there are other sections in the law that allow for it. So is, is my understanding incorrect? Because I, I, I certainly support the contention about ensuring that there's proper publication. Uh, it is. Let me just reiterate that there are other provisions, uh, 5122 or something like that, that uh, Senator Tony Ed, I think it was, introduced last and was passed. Uh, originally, the, pub the law itself didn't talk about the manner of, of notice. 
uh, it simply said adequate public notice shall be given in a reasonable time. So um, what we've said here that adequate public notice shall be given, and we've added the words, in a manner and in a reasonable time uh, to foster effective competition. So we've given a bit more guideline on what that might be. Uh, and the regulations are the appropriate place as we had moved from uh, uh, notice boards on websites to uh, perhaps uh, broadcast tweets, I don't know, uh, whatever the whatever's going to be the uh, forthcoming means of communication that, that, that we can't foresee right now. So uh, I, I don't disagree uh, with uh, Mr. Camacho at all that uh, perhaps we want to give a little bit more uh, detail as to what we mean by notice and when notice has to be published, but the regulations as they exist right now uh, do talk about uh, public notice uh, under section F of 3109 uh, says that, that public notice will be given first by distribution uh, and then secondly every procurement in excess of $25,000 shall be publicized at least once and at least seven days before the final date so uh, in a newspaper general cir circulation so it doesn't mean that you don't have to uh, it doesn't change the rules about when you have to publish everything. And if you want to make the rule that they have to publish every IFB, regardless of the amount of the IFB, I would only object to that. I just think that it's a bit burdensome. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> so, but that's what the law is, and we're talking about. So, if they're not going to do it anyway, it doesn't make any difference if we add it into the law. But what we need to do is begin to enforce some of these things. That's really the biggest problem with with procurement is not so much the law. Yes. I do have another question, uh, and I did say this in my testimony, and this is in Section 4 is where we begin uh, a number of things to be promulgated by the policy office. And my question really is more, uh, is there a poly policy office right now that can take on this? Because this bill does say that for the policy office to promulgate regulations. Yeah. And my, my question in my written testimony was, who is the policy office? And I think we handled that last time when we were looking at Articles 9 and 12. And I think we basically tasked, was it your office that we tasked, I think, to? Yeah, but I'm not the policy office. I understand. Yeah, but I'm for not the policy office. And, and, but, and you refer to the policy office starting now. And uh, as I mentioned in my testimony, uh, uh, the policy says the policy office but on this very section, just above on page 8, the policy office shall come such as may be efficacious in the use of this missile under this subsection. So just in section 4 alone, even though you may have given us the, the task, you still reference, it's kind of like inconsistent you're still referencing the policy office in this section and throughout the bill. And then come at the very end, and at the very end, now to say, oh, uh, oh, but it's except for, notwithstanding any other thing, the public auditor shall. So all I'm pointing out to you is this policy office. That's really where I'm pointing out to you. Because you say throughout policy office, policy office, then at the very end say, okay, public auditor, do it. It goes, it goes back to our earlier testimonies in, in many of the earlier uh, bills uh, in terms of uh, the policy office historically uh, hasn't been staffed, hasn't been funded, or if it was, it was done inconsistently. And uh, it really does serve an important function for procurement. It's supposed to keep procurement up to date with good regs. And uh, that's just, you know, that just hasn't happened uh, historically. Uh, so. Uh, uh, once again, I would I would echo uh, the sentiments of the public auditor. Encourage uh, either fund a policy office or find an agency such as the OPA uh, that's capable or has a budget and the personnel to. Uh, uh, it doesn't have to be the OPA, uh, but uh, that could manage uh, the continuous updating of our procurement law with good regs uh, as needed. May I have one final response to that. Well, final, let's put that in quotes. Uh, the, um, the policy office is a creature of Article 2. We're dealing with Article 3. And so Article 2 will come up eventually, and the policy office itself was, uh, there were three versions of a policy office that were um, 
recommended in the ABA model code. We chose one of them. We chose the least effective one. That is, it's in the governor's office who doesn't really want to fund it or do it. Um, now, there, there's another model that's available, and we put we can you know smoke on this for when Article 2 comes up as to whether we do want to change that policy office. But in the meantime, it was the wisdom of the ABA model code and our adoption of it in Public Law 16124 that there ought to be some uh, overriding, as Mr. Camacho said, uh, office task and uh, enabled to, to do this. Otherwise, you end up with another procurement policy office, uh, a procurement advisory council, I should say, which yes. was never funded, and uh, uh, the people who were appointed didn't didn't show up, uh, and uh, and it became in totally uh, just, yeah, dead on arrival. Uh, so uh, I, I agree with that, and I but I like the, the, uh, the and until that time, we have that discussion. The, um, it, when this bill first came up, we did add a provision that says that the policy, until the policy office takes over and does anything with this, the, the public auditor was was empowered to write the regulations to act as the policy office in that regard. And I think that kind of um, stopgap measure is um, not inappropriate. <coughs> okay. Move on <coughs> to. Uh, Yes, yes, Ms. Toft. Um, Jessica Toft here. I, I had questions about um, 5211B. Um, the, the, the added language at the end states that bidder responsibility will not be determined by the information in the IFB, meaning, which, which I assume to mean that if you put a specification in your IFB and a bidder submits a bid that doesn't comply with that, you can no longer find them non-responsible. Uh, that's not been the law, uh, and that is not what this says. The determination of bidder responsibility is determined by reference to an inquiry. Uh, by the agency. When you're trying to determine if a bidder is responsible, you ask them for information. What this last sen sentence says here is that the determination of bidder responsibility is determined by the Section 5230. It's not determined by information required by the invita invitation for bids. Uh, the invitation for bids requires specifications for what it is that they want. The invitation for bids doesn't require who you want. It's a bitter determination of bitter responsibility that makes you decide whether you want to do business with that bidder or not. So you so so um, does that mean that if we put a certain specification in the bid and they don't comply, you cannot find what, them non-responsible? What it speaks to is the provisions that we have found in IFBs that said you have to include a copy of your business license, for instance, in the IFB. And if it's not there when it's open, then, then you're be deemed to be non-responsive. But that confuses what is meant to be a responsive bid and what is meant to be a responsible bidder because a license goes to responsibility, and the law has always said that responsibility is determined up to award. So that's what we're talking about here. I, so so it, it seems maybe that the intent is not clearly conveyed by this language then. Well, the intent is pretty wor very obvious uh, in the law through the casework, through decisions by the public auditor about when the determination of responsibility is made. And it's because of confusion like that that we try to make this clear that the determinant of responsibilities be not determined in the bid package. Shouldn't, shouldn't you be able to put specifications that you, they have to meet, and if they don't meet it, then you should be able to find them not responsible? This says you can't. That's what, a, that's what an IFB is for, that. is to say that we, we want to have uh, this, certain this requirements, certainly, but to determine the, and if the, if the, if the, if the bid specifications say you have to provide a qualification statement that names your, your company secretary, for instance, and you don't do that, then that's meaningless because that's a question that goes to responsibility. It, it is not, 
uh, it's not meaningless. It's a requirement that you have to ultimately meet, but you don't have to meet it at when the IFB becomes uh, fixed, which is that opening. Those, those other things are not determined by bid opening. Now, if you want to change this, it says the determination of bidder responsibility is not determined at bid opening. That's fine, but we've already said that because we've said it's before uh, uh, the award. Yeah, it, it just seems that this unnecessarily limits it and makes it so that you cannot use the specifications in your IFB to determine non-responsibility. You don't. You don't have to prevent in, provide information with your bid in, in order to be determined responsible. In fact, 50, uh, Section 5230 refers to the... Uh, uh, the regulations didn't make that determination. The regulations make it clear it's done by uh, a inquiry method. After you open bids, you would make inquiries. D do you do you qualify? That's what that that is not done at bid opening, and it's typically done not done at bid opening because you would have to qualify every bidder uh, at bid opening, which is a lot of resources of everybody being wasted because it's really only the intended awardee, as, as the regulations call the prospective contractor, that you're concerned about whether they're responsible. But F under responsible bidder in your definition section says you do have to determine it before award. Yes, before award, not at bid opening. Uh, competitive still bidding, bidding is talking about what do you do at bid opening. It, and the invitations for bids do not, uh, it talks about the infinite, infinite invitation for bids and what goes into that process. And what we're trying to differentiate here is that, and I think it'll be clear uh, in, in the cases that we've already had on Guam and certainly the federal cases that determination of responsibility is not determined b simply by what is in the bid package. Okay, any further, <clears throat> any further discussions on this? No further discussions in section four. Yeah, I still. Yes, please. Um, excuse me. Yeah, the section. Oh, in the award section G. How long are we supposed to keep the award on the internet? Announcement. I mean, after a while, it's going to be kind of uh, a lot of documents on the Internet. I mean, can we keep it on, like, five years? Is, can we have a limitation? I don't, let's see. I don't think it says it here, does it? No, that was in uh, 5122 or whatever that provision that Senator Tony had ahead. There's another section on the yeah, that, that talks about how long. This this talks about the notice of the award, and the point is well taken. It doesn't put a time limit on the notice of award, uh, and uh, so I would just ask Bob, why don't you come up with recommended language for that that, that puts a limitation on it? Well, I'm just saying, like, you know, five years after the award is issued, I would assume that's more than sufficient time. Maybe a Rather suggestion would forever. be the, during the term of the contract. So if the contract ends after three years, then it goes it goes away. So maybe wording, um, because there are other sections in the law that says you're supposed to post contracts on your website. There are other. So while your contract is active, so once it's terminated, you know, let's say whatever the end date is, that's when you take it off. So that will, you know, uh, to be... Uh, continue until during the term of the contract would be probably the appropriate language there. Okay. So you're making that suggestion here? Yeah, yes. so I've made note of it yeah. and uh, we'll take a look at it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, I have a, uh, just a comment. On um, the same section G, uh, lines 15 to 16 on page 7, where it says the notice of award shall specifically state that the bid of the awardee is unconditionally accepted. Um, I don't think there's really, you know, too much problem with that, except it goes back to the question as to whether um, an off-island vendor who is responsible and capable of getting a business license in Guam now gets the award and, you know, maybe is unable to get a business license for whatever reason. Um, 
you know, if we're going to allow off-island vendors to get business licenses after the award, maybe we should just say so and say, you know, it's okay to get a business license after award, and that doesn't go to your responsibility. But um, I guess it's the words unconditionally accepted, you know, and then they don't get their business license. So um, my suggestion is just, you know, maybe we can sort of modify that to say that the bid of the awardee is you know, accepted, subject to, you know, proper licensure um, and permitting, something like that. And that, and that's all. Okay. There is a, uh, there is already a court opinion issued by uh, Judge La Morena to that effect because uh, it was the appeal having to do with the um, sirens, the way back when, uh, <laughs> and what, uh, uh, the tsunami sirens. Okay, it was that appeal, and uh, we actually determined in our own de because of that we actually determined the off island ben vendor uh, as non qualified because he did not have the license at the time, and Judge La Morena in his ruling said no responsibility can be done afterwards, uh, and therefore uh, uh, I guess did reverse uh, our, our decision because it factored on that one issue of the business license. And so what we in OPA have done is to say that a, a Guam license or a license from the jurisdiction in which you are domiciled, okay? And then, uh, and I'll give you a further example. We just recently awarded, uh, we had two vendors, both off-island because we are doing electronic work papers and all of them are off-island vendors. And so we, we gave notice to the one, and it actually, they came back for an ex extension of time to get their business license because they, they could not get it within the 30 days. So we had to give them an, an extension of time because, as I mentioned, both were off-island vendors, and we had selected one uh, over the other. So uh, there is precedent already, but it is confusing with, with this, you know. When is it? And not everybody is aware that you uh, need to submit the business because, as been as already said, business license is a responsibility issue. That you are a responsive bidder at the time. Uh, uh, it is confusing because respons responsiveness is the bid at the time. Responsibility can be determined after bid. Can I just? I'm oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, Jessica talked. Um, so. Uh, we have case law that says that responsibility can be determined after award. Correct. But this law would take that away, and it says responsibility must be determined before, before award. And that was my, and that was my whole point. <laughs> so, so it wouldn't that case law wouldn't fix what Sandra's talking about. If I can respond to yes. Sandra's um, comment about the uh, unconditional <laughs> exception. Uh, accepting the bid unconditionally. The the law has always been that uh, uh, the bids shall be unconditionally accepted without alteration. That's in uh, Section E. And, and uh, what we found that uh, bids weren't being unconditionally accepted. The award that was made ch made changes uh, to the bids and allowed changes to the bids, sometimes material changes to the bids. And so we've modified that unconditionally accepted part up there to say that bids shall be unconditionally accepted for evaluation without alteration or correction. And then we've made it clear that the bid still has to be accepted unconditionally in that language down there. So we've just basically moved that unconditional acceptance from E to G. The, the, the what you were saying about an E there was in lines three and four, and the bids shall be unconditionally accepted for evaluation. That's right, because subsection E mm -hmm. talks about bid acceptance and bid evaluation. Subsection G talks about award. So when you say you, it, it's accepted for evaluation under the evaluation process in sec, subsection E, but it shall be awarded un unconditionally as uh, because section G, G deals with the award of the contract.
I, I guess I am. I guess I, I too, am somewhat on that line 16 there about the <coughs> unconditional acceptance of the, the bid. There was the unconditional acceptance of the bid for evaluation yes. in paragraph E, <clears throat> and then under G for award, notice of award shall specifically state that the bid of the awardee is unconditionally accepted. Uh, are, we, are we saying that in awarding the bid, the, the offer that was made is being accepted without any sort of changes or conditions placed on it. Condition, yes. Yeah, again, look at what we're dealing with. We're dealing with a section that had to do with just accepting the bid, which made it sound like you're accepting it as an award. I mean, that's what you do in contract law. You accept the offer, and then you have a contract. And what the language said, bids shall be unconditionally accepted without alteration or correction. That's the existing language. But then it went on to talk about how you evaluate them. So if every bid was accepted, you'd have multiple contracts for the same thing. So the, la the language of acceptance is contract law. Uh, and the language of award is prop procurement law. So we thought that it's better to put the, con the language of acceptance in the award provision uh, when, we, when we talk about, because this is a procurement law, this is not necessarily contract law, although contract law is the basis of it. That's, that was the change that was made. Okay. Now I'm confused. Because <laughs> 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 uh, we just had a recent case uh, where uh, we just issued it uh, two weeks ago. It's uh, G uh, IP and E versus GPA. Yeah. And uh, the allegation was whether or not uh, uh, the award was uh, was modified by additional inf in 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 information. So, John, I'm I'm confused because we've always gone that once the once the bid is in, you cannot touch change it. You can clarify uh, uh, language uh, uh, in the sense, but it cannot change your price. Uh, uh, and uh, and because we had actually uh, another bid with GVB where they said, no, this is not the price because of you know multiplying out by the, the number of stations. Let me you know, in simplicity. Of, uh, no, I'm sorry, it was public health and, and, and security guard services. All right. So it's that interpretation. You know what is the price and how it gets uh, knocked out. That is always the key here. Did did the bidder add language at the time of bid opening to modify its bid? That's really the issue here. And, and we always have gone on the principle that the bid cannot be modified whatsoever. You can, you can provide explanatory language, but you cannot change your price. So just, this yeah. doesn't change that at all. That concept still remains. Again, the, the language up here that we originally had said that you accept the bid. And in contract law, when you accept an offer, the bid is the offer, you've got a contract. And it's not meant to award, Section E was not meant to award a contract. It was just meant to evaluate the bids. Subsection G was meant to award a contract. And when you award the contract, you have to make sure that you unconditionally accepted the bid, that you, you, know, you have to unconditionally accept an offer to make a contract. And this is the same thing here. It was just clarifying that the acceptance language, it was an E, did not determine the, that it was an award. Okay. I, I have a, a related question, um, but it's not necessarily to the modification, but to the government's ability to waive. Um, so in F, where it emphasizes that there can't be any material changes in or waivers of specifications or factors or contract terms. Um, I, I guess where does this leave the government if the government has a contract, enters into a contract with a bidder and then decides afterwards that it doesn't really need one part of the bid? Um, does the government have to cancel the contract every time? 
and rebid it? Why can't the government waive its needs if, if it decides afterwards that something's not necessary? It seems like this requires the government to automatically cancel the contract and rebid, which seems like a lot of extra work. Again, you're talking about waiver of provisions of a contract. This is pre-contract stuff. This talks about correction or withdrawal of bids, canceling awards, and you can't waive provisions no, in the bid. It says waiver of any contract term. Well, the contract contracts. requirements are spelled out in in the uh, <coughs> IFB. You, you, you demand warranties or you don't. All those contract terms are, are in the IFB. How, what is the time for performance? Where are you going to deliver? All of that stuff, those are contract terms. So those contract terms can't be changed between the time that you submit the bid and the time that you make the award. Now, after award, when you have a contract, if the government wants to... Uh, change a provision to waive a provision like that so long as it doesn't exceed the scope of the contract the scope and the field of competition then that's within the government's prerogative this says this the title is cancellation of awards so this, this correction and withdrawal of bids cancellation of awards so it seems like even after you've awarded the government can't just decide it doesn't need something anymore and waive it it implies that it applies, uh, it's after award, too. It's cancellation of awards made on bid mistakes. It's not made on the government's prerogative to want to waive something. So this language seems to imply that it, it just limits the government's ability to do that. Because it, it doesn't have, it's not, um, it seems unclear that the government could still waive things in its prerogative. Before, after the bids are submitted and before the award is made, the government can't change those things. Right, this doesn't... And this they can cancel the solicitation if it, if for particular reasons, but they can't... At, uh, well, at, after you've submitted this stuff, they can't even do that. They can reject all bids if, if needed. But they cannot change it, unilaterally change the terms of the IFB, any material terms, and material is in there not change but why can't they waive one that's a change why not because you've gone through the process of soliciting and you've advised the public that this is and you've solicited bidders who come in and spend a lot of time preparing a bid and then you change it on at the last minute after they've already submitted their bids that's why it, i guess i guess i'm i'm just saying if there's a if you've, this says, this says cancellation of awards, so you've awarded a contract. It, it, this doesn't make it clear that it only applies. It says cancellation of award or contract based on bid mistakes. It doesn't say any contract, it just says particular contracts, ones that have a bid mistake in them. Okay, so I've annotated this as something that we need to take a closer look at, and we'll go ahead and, unless there's any further discussion on this section uh, we can go ahead and move on to section five okay section five will probably take us the rest of the time that we have <laughs> John <laughs> well uh, I reiterate what I said earlier <laughs> Yeah, the question that was asked is this is the same as the old one. Uh, it's based on the language of the old one. It incorporates, um, it's informed by the provisions made in the um, changes in the model code in 2000. But when you say the old one, what old, was originally in the law and then it got repealed yeah, and now yeah. we're putting it back? back yes, in. sir. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. It, it's a, as I said before, it's a, it's a best value. Uh, just b by way of explanation. Price is absolutely essential in every bid method, um, but it's treated differently. And for instance, the IFB price is, it, there's only, it, it determines the, the award. Assuming everybody is responsive and responsible, price determines the award. Low price wins, boom. In an RFP, price is not relevant at all until you've selected your, your, your best offeror, your, your most qualified offeror. 
you don't even discuss price. You want, you want the quality of the person. Then you discuss price with the most qualified, and if they don't agree on a fair and reasonable compensation, then you go down to the second one. So price is, a sec is secondarily in one case, it's primary in the other case. Here, price can be, uh, you don't have to award to the lowest bidder. You can award to some, to a, uh, a, you can trade off the quality of the product against the price and award to a higher bidder. And it's that process, that subjective process, that, that makes the moral hazard in, in this case. Yes. Yeah, uh, first of all, as we said in our testimony, I think this aspect is needed. As we said, this is going to be new territory. Uh, and uh, as I was discussing with legal counsel here, there are regulations already by ABA. Uh, the issue, I'm just trying you know, uh, uh, to figure out in my mind, because we do have two extremes, as John mentioned. The RFP, and I'll give you an example. When we were going through the evaluation of, uh, and we decided on teammate, I can open, say, because that's who the award has been made to, teammate. When we opened up the price, my kind of took my breath away. And I didn't know, you know, and I really wanted to know what the other bidder had to see if that, that price was in the realm, but I couldn't open the other bid. We had to return it back. So my question to John Moore is, would this be available? Could I, use, could I have used this method under, the, uh, under a competitive uh, CO? Because this was for audit software. Uh, and then likewise, I want to do the con, you know, just more for clarification, what is the intent of all of this? Uh, uh, because where I can see the potential abuse, okay, is in where, like, cars or rate, you know, we want, uh, and that happened, or, or, or like uh, ambulances, you know, where we've had a number of cases where the, you know, the specifications were so such that it had to be, you know, co coming from company XYZ, therefore limiting competition. So maybe what I'm looking for, John, is uh, examples of when when would we use the competitive seal proposal and uh, uh, in the IFB process and could we kind of modify it with the RFP process because we've got two extremes where price only and then we got the other extreme where you don't even look at price and and then you know like when I looked and evaluated you know, I had to go and ask other people, is this about the price you paid you know, for this product? You know, because I, couldn't, I did not know what bidder number two was offering. So that's kind of like, I'm just looking more for guidance uh, because a lot of agencies are going to be uh, asking th this area and, and I think we owe it to them to kind of give them like a, a, a 101 lesson on competitive seal proposals. When is it appropriate to use, when it's not appropriate to use? And I don't think th this is, it, when, when do you decide is where I'm looking for. When can price, uh, when can you not give it to the lowest bidder and give it to the next highest bidder is, is my question. I'm looking for guidance there because to be proactive to ensure that it doesn't get abused, I think either GSA or someone or the Attorney General or OPA or a combination needs to go out and give guidance to the agencies so that it is done correctly at the onset. And, and my layman's understanding of this source selection method is that basically uh, we identify evaluation factors and provide a weighting to them, a weight to them. And price is one of those evaluation factors, but does not have a weight of more than 50%. In fact, I think we indicated that in here. And so after we add up, after we evaluate the proposal then, you know, and, and give them the, their appropriate weight, uh, then I guess the proposal that was submitted with the highest uh, evaluation number number of evaluation points will basically then be awarded that proposal may not necessarily have the lowest bid associated with it but price is is not more than 50% of the factors for consideration again I saw that in the reading I'm just been trying to figure in my mind right. what procurement and would I, be appropriate to not use that you know, 
us up. Yeah. That's I, where I'm coming from. Because I, I it's the understood. real practicality, the, the real of uh, yeah. the essence of doing this. Because I think we as a government, when we introduce this whole new concept, we need to make sure, well, I mean, we're not going to get everything, but I think we need to be proactive in helping educate the agencies as to when is, uh, as an example, these are the types you may want to consider. You know, when is it appropriate to use? Don't just say, because yes, I can read this, but I want real life examples of when it's appropriate you know, okay. uh, to be more proactive from an educational point of view, because what is happening now the, your, your essence was we didn't get enough education in all of this, and that's why we're having so many protests or I, delays. I, I think we're in, in the RFP, it was, there was some clarity as to when do you use an RFP for professional services, uh, et cetera. Uh, it's not, I guess, that with competitive seal proposals. We haven't probably put the language in here, but is it for equipment as well as brain power? You know, because that's you know, uh, because the courts have defined its services to be brain power. If, if it's uh, janitorial services is not considered brain power, it's considered an IFB process. Right. Whereas you know, uh, software auditing, you know, are considered brain power, and that's the dis distinction distinction we make because of that Guam Supreme Court case. You know, uh, and again, uh, maybe we do need to define it ca can be used for what kind, you know, otherwise it's going to be open to everyone's interpretation if we don't define it here. And, and if we're going to be the ones doing the regulations, I want to make sure we're clear on what types of things we can use it for. Could, could we just maybe hear from GSA? Uh, thank you. I think the word competitive seal proposals is misleading in the sense that proposals are used for professional services. What I think uh, this section really does is go back to what we're already using, and that's called the multi-step proposal, which is two parts. First, we do the definition of what is the evaluation criteria that we're looking for, and those companies that meet the minimum qualifications usually 70%, then, uh, th then those individuals are then put in. Then we get the lowest price. And then they after, then you select the, let's say, the top three. Whoever meets the, uh, no. uh, are qualified, or deemed qualified. Oh, okay, okay. And, yeah. Okay, yes. fine. So, so it could be as many as w w yeah. everybody who says. And, and then after that selection is made, then they submit their second envelope. Well. Uh, at the moment, what we're doing, yes, uh, is that they submit their envelopes at the time so that uh, it does two things. One, nobody gets to inflate if there's nobody else. You know, they already have their pricing of, at the time. But nobody sees it if they're not deemed qualified. It's always kept closed. So those individuals that are deemed qualified are called in to a second round, and all those people are there, and then we open in front. Okay. All right. But I think... That's, we already have that if we're looking at supplies and services. And if, if I may, the competitive sealed proposals, when it was initially put in the law and taken out the following year, I think it was 1718 or 1744, public law 1744, the reason it was taken out was a great fear of the legislature of abuse and uh, uh, that could occur. They didn't want that, and that's why they took it in their wisdom, took it out. And you know, we've been able to work since that time period. Okay. John? Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm glad uh, Mr. Cono brought up the multi-step bidding as a, a, a comparison. But multi-step bidding uh, is, is determined by low price. Yeah. Assuming everybody is uh, responsive and responsible, and you go through the step, the first step to determine who are the acceptable uh, offerors. And then amongst the offerors, the lowest bid wins. This doesn't happen in this case. You assume if you, you, you fare it through to find the acceptable offerors, and then the government determines, based on the offerors, who has the best value. Uh, and the, this has become the, the go-to method for most federal procurement uh, over the last three decades, primarily because of the services component. Uh, it used to be the procurement was things. 
there were no services procured really. And, and now everything is a service. And we have a, a complex, not professional in the old school way of thinking about a professional, we have complex um, management systems, complex uh, software dra uh, writing and, and, and all of that, that the federal government says they just cannot procure without having this, this uh, best value method. Uh, I, I was horrified by the moral hazard that was in it, and I understand why they wanted to repeal it after, as soon as they adopted it. But uh, it, it, in the world that we live in today, and, uh, and particularly when we start talking about public infrastructure projects, when you're combining not just uh, contractors, you're putting contractors and financiers and architects and, and uh, project managers all together in one big deal, you need to have some kind of method that is flexible enough to weigh all those things and, and, and come up with an, an ulti ultimate decision. So uh, they each has their own place. And I, I really want to respond, respond to Doris's comments about um, when do you not use this. I think that it is totally um, in, in, inappropriate to use, for instance, in cars. You mentioned cars. Uh, I think commodities should be out. Standard uh, standard services should be out. When you're looking for a janitor or air conditioner mechanic. You know, they're in the phone book. You know, we call them up all the time. We don't need much more than that. I think that that should be out. There is a provision uh, which which says that uh, the the, the um, uh, conditions of use. Anyway, it it, it throws it. Oh. Uh, A6 on uh, page 10, line 8, uh, throws it into the hands of the people who write the regulations to uh, specify any other conditions, and it could be done there. Uh, it wasn't put in the ABA model code to say that this cannot be used for commodity items or what the feds call uh, uh, commonly used office shelf products. Uh, but if it's a standard commercial item or a standard commercial service, I think this is inappropriate for it. I, I always understood that, you know, the difference between, for example, the multi-step bid is that it puts the burden on the procuring agency to really clearly define its, the specs of what it is that it's wanting to procure. Whereas with the, in this case, for the competitive seal proposal, uh, I think that the competing agents, I mean, the um, procuring agency is wanting to know what the idea is, H how do you propose to provide this sort of service, you know, given the circumstances. And then, um, under the competitive seal proposal, then we take a look at all these proposals and, and I guess, pick the, the one, that maybe the top three, and and then from there ask, let's say, the top rated uh, proposer to submit their, their application. I, I, is that, my that, layman's understanding of that correct? That, that's, it really is, because I was just reading a GAO uh, decision a couple days ago where it involved a bid, an RFP, uh, RFCP we call it, uh, for uh, some technical services across a, a variety of needs. And they said that each proposer offered a completely different means of achieving the outcome that was desired. The government's job is to declare the outcomes that are desired, not the methods. If you don't have, if you know what it is precisely you want, you should use an IFB. But if you don't know what the methods that are available, what the best best method is to achieve an outcome, you go to this method. And uh, that, that illustrated the point exactly. You have three different ways to do it. Every one of them is acceptable. So you look at the one that meets all of your, your criteria, all your outcome objectives better than, um, better than the others. And in that case, you can take a higher price if you think that the other quality uh, attributes of, of an individual proposal are going to save you money in the long run or, or get your product a lot faster and more certainly. Okay. Doris? Oh, I'm sorry. I, uh, no, again, it's that... Uh, because the way it's read, you are saying it shouldn't be used for commodity type prices, but the way it's read, you could conceivably do yes. this. And this is, again, the guidance that, you know, especially if we're going to be tasked for the regulations. And I think to be, you know, because this could be subject, you know, as a subject to abuse and looking what was the intent uh, as to 
which items. And if it's not meant to be for commodity, then I think we need to be very explicit and say it's not meant to be for commodity-like price things. And, and Section A, adding another condition in Section A to that effect, I think would be entirely appropriate. Okay. Jessica? Uh, um, I, I, I'm, I'm in total agreement with the public auditor's comments. Um, and I'm looking at the limiting language of that Section A, and it says it shall not be used when another method of source selection is required or as appropriate. Is as supposed to be is? What, line, what line are you on there, please? It's um, page nine, line two. Yeah, okay, nine, on. line two. It shall not be used when another method of source selection is required or as appropriate. Or, or is appropriate. Uh, yeah, is wouldn't is probably would be a better. Is, yeah. Okay, it's supposed to be is, um, and then. Um, so it, uh, the problem with being is appropriate, as I think through this, um, is that uh, you can actually acquire professional services using this because we've taken the RFP method and said you shall acquire professional services by the RFP uh, 5216 method. Um, we said that's, that's made because it, there's great a lot of gray line between what is a professional services as that case showed. And so uh, when you're not certain or when quality isn't you know your, your main criteria, when quality is your main criteria and RFP is the way you want to go because that gives you the opportunity to choose your best to rank them choose your best and negotiate a price with them. So uh, in, in this case, it, if we use the word is rather than as appropriate, it, it is appropriate to use an RFP because it says that. You will use it for s professional services, but we don't want to limit, delimit that primarily when we get into the uh, uh, complex construction projects. And we don't know whether, we know an engineer and an architect, those are professional services, the law said it, but if you have a project manager, where do they fit into it? Uh, and uh, it's, so it's, uh, we wanted to keep that flexibility and that's as appropriate to use this one or another one. Okay. All right. Well, I guess um, I, I, I agree with the public auditor's comments that this is going to be very difficult for agencies to apply um, because it says you can't use this if another method is appropriate. And for an agency to determine what's appropriate without any guidelines or without any clear um, clear statement, this is, this is proper and this is not proper, um, it's going to be, I think it's going to be a, a real quagmire of protests and, and, and dispute. Okay. All right. All right. Any further questions on this section? Just uh, just a couple. They're, they're very brief. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the uh, ambiguity we uh, we discussed the uh, phrase or is appropriate quite up. But uh, there's another ambiguity that appears on uh, line 24, page 11 in this section, and uh, that concerns uh, debriefings. Uh, procurement officers authorized and encouraged to provide debriefings that furnish the basis for the source selection decision and contract for work. Uh, I just believe that the word debriefing should be deleted in its entirety. Uh, it's basically another vague and ambiguous thing. It's like, what, what is a debriefing? There's several different legal interpretations and military ones uh, for that same, that same phrase, no, no joke. Uh, and then uh, uh, from a practical standpoint, uh, on line 25, page 9, um, this would require that uh, in this process, there's discussions with the offerors, and it states that the head of the purchasing agency or the uh, uh, chief procurement officer or the director of public works uh, would have to sit down or be present for those discussions. I think that uh, uh, these are normally uh, uh, <coughs> not uh, discussions that uh, the heads of purchasing agencies or these high-ranking officials are normally involved in. And uh, uh, that should be uh, amended so that it allows essentially uh, these officers to designate a uh, procurement officer or such other person to conduct uh, these discussions uh, uh, on their behalf, uh, like all the other uh, 
uh, discussions that we have for the RFP process. I, I believe that would just be too onerous. Okay, John. Got any comments there? Uh, don't have any uh, ob objection to that that idea. But uh, again, we were talking about this, the abuse that this thing presents opportunity for. And by requiring the highest per level in person in the office to take part of this, we'll make sure that it doesn't get used for going out for bids for garbage collection or something like that. Uh, it, it, it will, it, it's one of the inhibiting factors for just using this willy-nilly. Um, and I think as we birth this, it's important for everybody to be on board to how, how they operate and for everybody to pay attention to how these things are, are meant to operate because there's going to be a, a learning curve. And we're going to start deep, deep, deep in the hole. But the, the, the states and other counties and, and cities and the federal government have been using this method for a long time. Nothing is foolproof. There are going to be problems with this as there are with IFBs. Uh, but uh, it, we can get better at it as we go along. And that's why I think having the head involved in this process is very, very important. Yes, go ahead. The, uh, the other point I just wanted to bring out was on okay. page 10. Since, since you haven't, just, just identified. Oh, I'm sorry. Since, Carla yeah. spelled on with the okay. AG's office. On page 10, um, subsection 5, on line, starting on line 3, regarding the evaluators, um, you know, we look at things and, and try to anticipate where there might be some issues or problems that are raised later on. And when it talks about all evaluators must be impartial persons acting in the best interest of the government, we assume that our evaluators are going to be government employees here. But at the same time, when we talk about what exactly does impartial persons mean here, because we can anticipate folks raising the point that, well, if they're in your department, they're not going to be impartial. Uh, or if they're in the government, they're not going to be impartial. So it's just more in terms of clarity and uh, in terms of looking at uh, anticipating where there might be some some ambiguity that uh, you know that, that could could be cleared up earlier. Who are these Who are these uh, evaluators going to be? Who can they be? Um, okay. Jessica John. Yes, Jessica. To, um, to add to that, um, the, the, this language also says they they shall independently assess. So really what's meant by an independent, does that mean independent of the government? It, it independently assessed seems to indicate it's someone outside of the government. Well, some of these projects are quite complex. Uh, take GFK, for instance, that bid. Uh, it was a very complex bonding, bond financing project uh, that was involved in it. And who were the evaluators? A bunch of teachers. We didn't know the first thing about that. But they were told by, by professionals who came in to advise them uh, what, what the outcomes and what, what that all been, what were the best choices. So they didn't make an independent determination. Uh, we expect that when they get very, very complex that there will be consultants that incorporated to, to uh, do this, but they have to be impartial if they're going to be engaged in it, and they have to make their, their own determinations uh, uh, in the evaluation. Uh, that's what we mean by impartial, and that's what we mean by independently assess. Yes. Jessica, Jessica Toth, sorry. It says all evaluators shall be impartial. Right. Do you want to have one or two impartial evaluators or no, what? No, no, but does that, does that mean that it can't be government employees? Why, where does it say that a government person is, imp is impartial simply because they're a government person? The, the, the ethics conflicts rules apply to government employees. This is essentially the same thing. It's a conflict situation. You have to be impartial. I think this, because impartial person, it, I think it's going to be a source of, of protest. I think that the, the source of protest is when you have partial persons. And so by making it clear to the people who are forming the staff of evaluators that you have to make sure that they're impartial. They have to be impartial anyway. That's what the conflict code is all about, the ethics. So if we don't put that in here now, we're going to say they have to be partial persons? I don't think that makes a lot of sense. No, uh, absolutely not. But it's already um, part of the qualifications f 
for the government. It's not stated anywhere specifically that they have to be. Um, it seems it seems like impartial person, as used in this context, is kind of a term of art. So you're suggesting probably deletion of that adjective. Impartial? Yes, because the code the. The government code of ethics already requires that the evaluators sign off. But there are going to be times when you have. That they're not going to be partial. By using it and saying you must be an impartial person, which the, the ethics code already requires that you be, you, you sign off and say you have no interest. In, and so it's already kind of defined. This, this makes it, this implies that it's something above and beyond just being uninterested. It seems to imply that it's it's a it's a new term of art or that it might be or that it means maybe somebody outside of the government. Can, but that, can, can that I, government employees can't do the evaluation. Can I jump in also if we leave the language as it stands, how does it apply to other types of proposals in terms of the evaluators? That they don't have to be impartial. Yeah, well, I mean, th 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 that's what I believe yeah, Ms. Top is trying to point out. That's correct. Well, then I would recommend the uh, appropriate thing, put this provision in all the others as well. I mean, if you want to tie that yellow ribbon around all the trees in the forest so we know where the gold is buried, that's, that's fine. But the, there are going to be times, and this contemplates, for instance, uh, GovGuam wants to put up a nuclear reactor for electricity to generate electricity. There's no government employee who can evaluate that. We're going to have to contract with consultants to come in and, and do the evaluations on the various bids to tell us how good or bad they are. Those are not government employees subject to the code of ethics. Those persons better be impartial, though. They should have no connection at all to, to any of the bidders, and that's what we're talking about here. This, this is not for our run-of-the-mill stuff. This RFCP is intended primarily for big projects, primarily for that. Yes. And with that comment, again, it's that definition is when to use it. Because otherwise, if it's not defined, it can be used for other things. And, and that's really where I'm going again, is that definition. And I think the, uh, the uh, JFK, as he raised it, might have been an appropriate project because that was the concern we had that there was no price. And that was, it ended up being, it ended up being the second most expensive school we've ever built because there was no price because it was an RFP. And let me just go on to explain what happened was, because uh, uh, we have, I mean, that, this was a three day hearing of which you were part of it. And what happened was the, the poor people who evaluated uh, had only one day to, to make a determination as opposed to making it over several days. And then Public Works, Larry Paris, took six months to evaluate the efficacy of their selection by bringing in other people to evaluate the, uh, 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 the financing. Because what made this very complicated was the financing, which really, even I, after reading it, didn't understand it. <laughs> uh, uh, and also, uh, that w this probably may have, could have been a, a good example. And again, my, my, I stress here the definition of when, you know, uh, uh, we can use this. Okay. All right, anybody um, else? If, yeah, yes. if I can just kind of jump, jump in. Um, when it, I think this is a good time pr probably, or in this section or in this bill to just kind of like pin down the evaluators and who they can be, whether, uh, because I, I agree that um, it can't always just be the government of Guam employees. The JFK uh, is a good example. The nuclear reactor is a good example. And uh, I've seen it personally on many road projects that, um, you know, DPW just unfortunately does not have the technical staff to evaluate it. So what they would do is call in a chief engineer from a utility agency from the port from GWA to help them round off this team or they would use one of their own private consultants that they have on retainer but then this re this consultant just has to pass a note to the straw man you know 
he's good, he's bad, and then that uh, consultant is not able to vote. So, you know, my recommendation would be, you know, well, I, I agree only a partial and, and all of that, but you know, since we're talking about evaluators, to just make, make it clear that um, evaluators, and my recommendation is that they don't only have to be GovWAM employees, and that everyone on the on the uh, the, whole, the whole team needs to be able to vote and voice their opinion, and not just write secret notes. Uh, ask him this, you know, find out about that, um, because that's exactly you know what is happening right now. So um, just just to get some expertise uh, to the table and make that expertise be, you know, counted. Okay. All right. Okay. Anything else? All right, we'll move on to sole source procurement. That's Section okay. 6. <laughs> My <nemesis. laughs> Hey, we're moving along pretty good. <laughs> moving along pretty good here. Okay. John? Although well, we didn't delete it, Notwithstanding Doris's <laughs> edict, <laughs> uh, it, it still exists, but we, we uh, again, to take some of the moral hazard out of this, uh, some of the subjectivity out of it, we, we've added uh, some restraints. Uh, in the past, you were able to award a sole source contract for five years, ten years, whatever, and this says you can only issue it for a term of not greater than one year with four options, and at the time the options are exercised, they still have to be the only sole source. In other words, times change, and some today we may not have a we may actually have a valid sole source selection we have to make, but a year from now somebody's moved on island and they can provide that service, and so at that point we need to put it out to bid. Uh, and there and there are other. Uh, things requiring market research to justify the sole source selection and such as that. Okay. Yes, ma'am. What I would like to see is maybe a self, uh, fail safe factor is before the award is actually made that the agency, and this would be for contracts again under the current law if it's 25,000, that the agency announce in a paper uh, that or a notice that a sole source contract is being awarded to company X for Y. Because right now, uh, that's, uh, it's uh, where what I have seen is people are not aware that a sole source contract has been awarded, and, and later on they learn after the fact in the paper that, uh, uh, that so-and-so got a contract that was sole source, but I was the, hey, I can provide this service too. And the, uh, the, uh, the tsunami one was the, the classic. It was when the, the other vendor learned in the paper that it was being awarded. So to be proactive in the sole source area is that where a sole source contract, again, following the current law, of where you have to advertise when it's 25,000, if the agency is going to make a sole source uh, a contract to in excess of 25,000 that there be an announcement made that a sole source contract has been awarded to you know uh, uh, to so-and-so because that's really the concern we have is that bidders are not aware that so-and-so and I could have done this can I just ask Please go ahead. You might be asking the question that I was going to ask, but go ahead, Mr. Okay. Brown. Right. I'm just confused by your, your comment. Is it? Do you want that notice to go out before or after the award? Before. Or that, uh, you uh, award it. I am awarding it to Company X, a sole to Company X. So at the time of the award, you announce it uh, to be open and transparent. Before the award. Well, you have. Thank you. 
issuing a notice of intent yeah. to award and then once that once that puts once that comes out and then I think from there uh, is that when the 14 day clock begins well and normally somebody told me that the uh, notice of intent to award was a that's myth. one of the uh, you no know, that's one of the justifications for notice of intent to award there's really it really doesn't exist in the procurement law regulation it's just more or less a practice uh, that has evolved uh, over time and not everybody uses it in the same way either but generally uh, uh, yeah a notice of intent to award could be used here if the idea was to uh, uh, give other potential vendors the opportunity to object or protest uh, the award of the sole source uh, contract uh, and there is that one case where uh, the only notice the uh, the protester had of the contract was, I believe there was a newspaper article, uh, and it had nothing to do with uh, the procurement, just the installation of these items. And then they uh, filed a protest saying, they're not the only vendor of this item. And that particular contract was way in excess of 25000 You know, that was almost uh, several million dollars, because that was a federal, that was a Homeland Security grant. So that's my concern here. Yeah. Senator, you had a question? Well, the question really was in line with Ms. what Mr. Brown asked, and, and of course it was chimed in with, uh, with uh, Attorney Kono, uh, because you, you were saying you'd like to see that notice go out after the award, and it's like, well, if it goes out after the award, how would that really do anything for someone who had the services that was, they had the capability to provide the service or, or the equipment, and so it seems like it's too late. Yeah, you you want to explain that because we have dealt with that in a number of times. Okay. No, no, it's not a yeah. The uh, the protest period runs when the protester uh, 14 days after the protester knows or should have known of whatever the basis of the protest is. So if there's an award uh, they're not aware because the sole source was never advertised, uh, and they become like the vendor uh, who, uh, who was reading the article and said, oh hey, uh, this shouldn't be sole sourced. I can do this. I want to do this and of filing a protest, and although it was months perhaps after the award, uh, the timing was still upheld because uh, they did file it within 14 days of knowing of the award. Uh, so you could do it there, or as uh, was discussed earlier, because this, this idea of a notice of intent award, it's not all we've discussed this several times uh, in these proceedings. Uh, that's You could use something like that here, where the award isn't effectuated until after this notice is out, people have had the opportunity to protest. You, you can do it both ways. Let me just mention also, continuing that, was that the uh, the JFK was protested uh, uh, twice uh, by the two vendors because, and they began the protest when uh, it was announced in the paper that IFB was going to do a bond because that's when, you know, the uh, Public Works unfortunately did not give them notice that the award was being made. They were still waiting. Public, no Public Works only gave the awardee and not the losers notice and so the losers did were not aware of it and that's why when they protested it was shortly after the notice of that IFB had gone out to se secure financing and their protest was made on the basis that they did not have the financing at the time why was the government of Guam being involved so again that's kind of like where uh, until you give it to so-and-so you you know that's when you begin to protest and I would like to see that so that the abuse of sole source is, is more, well, so that there will not be abuse and it's more transparent. I, I have, um, I, I think it's a great idea to give the notice uh, for, uh, that they won't, they won't issue an award for uh, sole source procurement uh, until they have published in the paper a notice that they are going to give the award and 14 days has elapsed. My actual pref preference would have been just to eliminate sole source, but I know. <laughs> I, I thought we had something in here that uh, there was this, I forget where we had it, the requirement that, the requirement that, you know, this uh, a notice of intent to award is must be issued, but then they had to wait like 14 days before you actually make the award. And this was to take care of issues like they had, I think it was at DOE, 
he announced the notice of intent to award in the morning. He, he awarded the... Uh, oh, oh, the same day. The yes. same day. Yes. And by the oh, time the, the guy, the other guy protested, <laughs> it was like 14 days into the project. Yeah. Oh, I do remember that. We did actually look at that, and th thank you for raising that. Uh, I don't remember the appeal now because they start to blend <laughs> in my mind. But uh, uh, that's why I think the award is better as opposed to the notice. The, uh, the notice of intent to award was issued today, and then the award letter was issued the same day. So a vendor getting the notice and the intent had no time to protest. I, it's my recollection. Yeah, and then the agency had 14 days to decide on his protest, right? Yes. And so by then, 14 days, I mean, he was like way into the project already. Yeah. Well, you know, the, yeah, it comes in two contexts. So it, the first has uh, been discussed where or there's an award. So we're going to give a notice of intent to award at 8 a.m. and then at 2 p.m. we're going to award. Yeah. So that, uh, you yeah. know, they avoid it or it avoid. avoids uh, protest for the award. Uh, or pre-award protests. The second one context is, as you mentioned, in a protest. So um, they'll have the protest, and then they'll get everything ready. They get all the ducks in a row, and then at 10 a.m. they'll deny the protest. At 11 a.m. they'll award the contract, mm -hmm. um, and that 14-day or 15-day period for the uh, protest or to appeal to the OPA uh, has not uh, expired yet. Uh, but we've dealt with that in terms of case law. Jessica. Hi, Jessica Tuft. Um, I guess uh, one concern that I have with is the limit on the one-year limit on the sole source contracts is that I, I don't really think this takes into account um, federal grants and procurements that are done with uh, federal grant funds. A lot of the federal grant funds come with very strict limitations on what products you have to buy, um, particularly with respect to um, uh, information technology. You know, if, if you're getting a Department of Justice grant and it says you have to get certain software so that you can access certain national databases um, and you're limited to only one vendor for this software, and this says you can only, so it's, it has to be a sole source contract. Um, but then it says you can't enter into an agreement with this software um, vendor for more than one year. A lot of software contracts are more advantageous and cheaper if you can do them for multiple years. This says, nope, you are limited to one year. And then, and then it says, that in order to keep renewing, you have to do market research, but that's that's really not applicable to a lot of software products um, or even you know computer hardware products. Certain things are only made to be compatible with certain other things. You have lots of um, uh, databases that can only be accessed with certain software, and you're stuck with that. Uh, and then and then. <coughs> You're going to have to do market research every year just to renew your software contract with the only software vendor. It seems okay. like this does not this does not account for information technology needs okay. of the government. Claudia, you had something. I just said for the record that with GSA, what we normally do every fiscal year is on all those existing equipments that requires a sole source, we put out an, an announcement, <coughs> and we list, we list down all these existing equipments. That requires this particular vendor to do the maintenance or provide whatever parts. Um, we do issue out an annual announcement you know, to the general circulation newspaper and list down all these um, different types of equipments that we are s uh, seeking to do sole source. And then we invite, if there's any, like um, uh, Mr. Brown stated earlier, um, there may be a company now Maybe last year there wasn't, there was only one, but now there's two. So then if that happens where they submit an interest, then we, we tell the department we can't sole source this any longer because there's a company available. So we do put out a newspaper ad of all the different existing equipments, um, you know, like public health with x-ray equipments. We put those announcements out so that if there's someone out there 
that can provide that maintenance service, then they're invited to submit an interest, show interest, so that when that expi when the existing expires, we now know to bid it out and not continue with the sole source okay. um, selection or method. Okay. Anybody else? <coughs> All right. Did you have something you? Yes. Oh, why don't you come join us at the table and identify yourself for the record? <laughs> Graham both on behalf of GPA. Just and on the mic. From, uh, no, we're still talking. Hello? Are we on? Okay, Graham both on behalf of GPA. And certainly with regard to the, um, I think the computer services, we've had difficulties with that. I mean, as some of you may not, may or may not know, um, with the AS400 and its derivatives um, that are used with the JD Edwards system and, and the software that goes along with that, um, IBM has a, a policy that um, only um, its hardware can be used with its software. So those services and some of the databases that have gone along with that, um, you know, they are the sole source. They're the only ones. Uh, the only difference would be is if there was some vendor that could take advantage of that. So certainly the one-year restriction certainly would be um, perhaps problematic um, for, for us in terms not only of cost but the fact that, um, you know, there's just simply nobody else to, uh, available to do that. Um, we do... You know, as, as we've been pointed out by <coughs> the public auditor, we do market research to determine, you know, whether there's anything else available. It's just for some of these things, um, well, including our short tail phones, there's only one vendor here. He has a letter from the manufacturer that says that um, he is the only person that can do the warranty services and effort on those phones. Now, the data, the voice and data part of that, we can use other providers, and we, we have, and those have been litigated substantially over the past year so um, I think we're pretty good on that side but it's just the actual uh, phones themselves um, we'd like to go to somebody else but we can't because as long as we stick with that particular one the vendor has something that says nobody else can can do that so uh, in, the, in that case I mean I don't think the one-year restriction doesn't really I mean other than other than increasing our costs it's not going to make any difference in the in the years to come uh, so that's just something to, to, to think about in, in terms of this and and um, I mean we, we, you know some of it we, we do anyway so we don't have any objection to the um, to the market researcher making certain that you know sole, sole source is the only avenue um, needed for that uh, and you know in terms of the hundred thousand dollars I mean I, I guess it just depends on on how many contracts are, are there and and what the uh, price for that and and also, there are, there are some softwares that we use on the engineering side that, once again, there's, there's, there's no one else other than the manufacturer that offers the, and it's more on a renewal. So, you know, you buy it, and then every year you have to pay a maintenance fee for the software to work. I mean, it's, there's no other way around it, and you can only go to the manufacturer for that. Um, so, I mean, some of the limitations, I, I guess that's just, you, you need to look at it when you first buy it, but there, there are certain limitations for that, so. I see, I see the provision that, that allows or grants flexibility in terms of renewal for RPC for additional terms. So just based on the concerns that you shared on behalf of GPA, is there any modification in the language that you would like to propose that will still safeguard the, the primary concern here? Well, I, I guess it's just it's just a cost thing, uh, yeah. as as um, Jessica had announced before. I mean, obviously, sometimes if you buy uh, for the maintenance services, if you if you uh, initially take um, you know more than one year, you do get a price break. So I guess it would just be that you're going to basically be you know one plus one plus one. You're going to pay the high price every time you renew. So that's that's just a, a, a concern with with that. Yeah, that's an excellent concern. Uh, just to speak to that, almost every, I, 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 I'm not sure if there's any con contract we have on GovGuam that goes for more than one year that doesn't have a provision in it that says that it's, it can be renewed only on the condition that we have funds to do it. So it's really a one by one by one by one by one contract. And, and the vendors know that going in. This is essentially the same thing. On the condition that you're still the sole source, if that, then, then you're going to get it. There's as much chance of them still being the sole source as GovGuam having the money to renew that contract. 
Mr. Chairman, if I may request uh, GSA, can I hear from you in regards to any cost savings? Because I know that if there's, let's say, a sole source for two extended period of time, two years or three years, it could result in significant cost savings for a sole source. And then maybe that can be incorporated in here because you're absolutely right, Attorney Brown, everything is subject to availability of funds on an annualized basis. But then if it, he could, GPA or any other government agency can save realistically 20% of the cost by consummating a two-year contract, sole source contract versus a singular year by year, then that perhaps may be an option or, or some verbiage that can be incorporated in here that the committee may consider. We've, we've, um, we've um, experienced that where, of course, multi multiple years, um, we do have cost savings, tremendous uh, cost savings. Um, however, even with that, with, uh, you know, taking a look or considering the cost savings, um, we still have to make sure, again, the, con the vendor is aware that it is only on an annual renewal, but they do afford that, uh, the savings. So they still afford the savings, even if they know it's uh, based on an, uh, an option, because again, it's based on, uh, upon availability of the funds. So we still, we still get vendors that will give us this uh, one year with a four year option with the <coughs> discount. Um, you know, but, but we, we, because we explained to them we cannot commit for prior fiscal years, because what if the funds don't become available? For the next year, but then this what this requires is that your renewal will be subject to going out there and putting out a notification, and if another vendor comes in with a similar pricing scheme or something a better option, then that would terminate that arrangement. So it's it's no longer a sole, sole source, source with an option to renew a second or third term, but it's a sole source for one year. But then any renewal is subject to. Uh, public notification before the award, so there, there's a different approach in regards to what is being proposed here. Yes. So that that's why uh, I'm leaning to you in terms of looking at any cost savings. If the cost savings would result in 15% plus in cost savings, then perhaps the committee, Mr. Chairman, may consider an option for a contract term of let's say two or three years. But everything, Attorney Brown, you're absolutely right subject to availability funds on an annualized basis. Mm -hmm. But in that, in this case, we can literally save the government some Money. change. Yeah. Okay, there's no further comments on sole source. We're gonna call it an end here. We got halfway through our agenda. One through six. Um, and our next uh, round table hearing will be on October 26 at two o'clock. We'll be sending out a um, no. notice, yes, uh, two to four. I think uh, attention spans uh, start to drift after that. All right, so with that, we're going to go ahead and uh, uh, we'll recess this uh, roundtable hearing until October 26. Thank you. Uh, 2 p.m. <laughs>